the 9 p.m. edition of the Urban Debate. Today is a day when much is being discussed and debated about the government's decision to scrap the three farm laws. The three farm laws that the government said was one of its biggest reforms. A year after a year of relentless protest by the farmers, they have scrapped it. Now comes another big policy issue. On the same day, the Allahabad High Court called upon the central government in a sense to look at uniform civil code to bring in this uniform civil code as it is in necessity now the court observed that the uniform civil code is not something that can simply be made purely voluntary when hearing a case they said ucc cannot be made purely voluntary that the parliament should intervene and examine it the Uniform Civil Code is mandatorily required and it will help in national integration. Uniform Civil Code, a d debate that gets reignited every now and then, where many believe that this country, which has different sets of personal laws, personal laws regarding marriage, divorce, inheritance, and so on and so forth, which are to closely to do with what you believe, what your religion says, and what your religious beliefs are. And they are codified and designed in a way to allow you to practice it differently than maybe somebody else from another religion in the same country. So there are essentially different sets of laws when it comes to marriage, divorce, adoption, inheritance in our country. And for long there has been a debate going on if it, there is a necessity to bring in one set of rules. Just like there is a constitution that everybody in this country follows and for everything else the law is the same, why should it be different when it comes to these personal laws? The court also made an observation on the interfaith marriages saying it is also necessary in such cases that immediate attention is needed for interfaith relationships, that you need to regulate such relations through legislative uh, intervention by bringing in the UCC, so the answer to all of the new laws that the states are coming up with, uh, to all of the ca cases that keep cropping up and problems that keep cropping up, whether they, you want to call it love jihad or anything else of interfaith marriages, uh, will also be addressed via a common court. Now, what is the status of uniform civil court in our country? This government, which is in power since 2014, was extremely big on it and has been constantly talking about it before they came to power and initially even after that. It was actually taken up by the 21st Law Commission. The Law Commission then asked for people to send in their views. Views of stakeholders were sought. Various political parties, different religious groups, everybody submitted what they thought should or shouldn't be done. But this law panel's term ex ended in 2018 itself. And since then, not much has happened. Will the government now look at the Uniform Civil Court on a day that it seems to be on the back foot, withdrawing the three farm laws, facing protests and backlash and several other of its recent policies? Can they look at something as controversial as the Uniform Civil Court? I say good evening to Prashant Umbrao, advocate with the Supreme Court, spokesperson for UPBJP, Deshratan Nigam, advocate with the Supreme Court, Sujata Paul, political analyst, Suhas Chakma, director for Rights and Risk Analysis Group, Professor Zina Chakrat Ali, founder, director for General Wisdom Foundation, uh, joining me this evening. First up, I want to go across uh, to Mr. Sanjay Hegre. Uh, Mr. Hegre, it's interesting that this commentary has come at a time when there is so much of already debate going on about government's controversial uh, legislations. Um, wh where do you stand on Uniform Civil Court? Well, the first thing that we'd have to define is what is a Uniform Civil Court? Are you going to take uh, good ideas from everywhere? Uh, for instance, uh, when you speak of a Uniform Civil Court, you do not have a Uniform Tax Code also. You have Hindu undivided families and Hindu men and women being, being assessed as two separate entities. Will you bring uniformity in that? See, uh, I keep, I keep uh, going back to what Justice Frankfurter said. He said, a phrase begins life as a literary expression. Its felicity leads to its lazy repetition. And repetition soon establishes it as a legal formula undiscriminatingly used to express different and sometimes contradictory ideas. 
What do you mean by a uniform civil code? Would, uh, would all citizens have the right to marry whoever they want? Uh, would that uh, possibly include uh, issues like same-sex marriage? What kind of uniformity are you going to put in? Uh, for uh, today, a, a, a Muslim cannot possibly adopt a child. They they resort to uh, they go through the provisions of the Juvenile Justice Act for fostering. Uh, there are different laws with regard to different communities as far as uh, uh, inheritance is concerned. On what basis are you going to uh, get it all into a uniform one? But, but one thing is sure after today, you cannot impose from above. It has to be done with discussions with all and, uh, and all stakeholders, all communities would have to be taken on board. There would have to be a draft agreed. You may arrive at a uniform civil code after consensus, but you can certainly not ram it through by legislative fiat or anything else. Well, one one lesson that uh, the government could take from the farm laws uh, uh, entire journey is that you do need to talk to the stakeholders, bring them in early on before you legislate something and push it through the parliament. Um, so let's start off with what Sanjay Egre has just put it on the table. Uh, Zina Shakat Ali, how would one define a uniform civil code? I think it's time for us to very seriously consider uh, that we have a uh, you know a, a common civil code. It is extremely important because I think uh, first of all the Constitution of India is saying it, and yes, of course I agree with what uh, you know Justice Hegde just said regarding a uh, you know community sorry, being I'm brought in. Sorry, I'm not I, a I'm, judge. Just I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. Hegde. Yes, I, I agree with that. That you see, communities have to be brought in. It has to be confidence, uh, confidence building, and trust building. But I think that it's time for us to make that draft. It's time for us to have a look. Uh, you know, enough time has, you know, enough water has passed under the bridge. And I think that, you know, especially for women's rights, especially where marriage, divorce, and inheritance are concerned, I think this law is extremely important. And please let me point out, uh, as an, you know, as somebody who who teaches Islam, as an Islamic scholar. That adoption is not forbidden in Islam. It was it was only the inheritance given to somebody who is not of your lineage. That was the discussion and the debate, not the adoption. So the Prophet Prophet Muhammad himself, may peace be upon him, had an adopted child by the name of Zaid. So I think you see there are many things that have to be brought to light, and uh, I think it's a very positive step. And I think you know since uh, the Honorable Justice Allahabad High Court has already spoken about it. I think it's time for us to start this discussion without, you know, creating any kind of impediments or problems and, uh, you know, move through it, discuss it. Let us look at the draft. I mean, there is, and have a discussion on it. Yes, I think, I think it's extremely important and from the Islamic point of view, even though, you know, when I come, if you ask me a question on what was polygamy all about, you look at the laws of Tunisia, for instance, over there, you're allowed to have only one wife because that is what the Quran is saying. Out of, out of you know, the, the entire 30 surahs that are in the Quran and all the verses that are involved in it, you know, there is only one verse that deals with polygamy and that also came during the time of war. Right. The Battle of Ahmad, when women were being widowed. So you have to consider that. And in the same surah, in the same, uh, you know, chapter, you have in surah 127 saying that you cannot deal emotionally with all of them, uh, with, uh, you know, more, more than one. So it is not asking you to marry, it is restricting. You see, it is in, in Islam, polygamy was a restrictive ordinance where you could have any number of women, 100, 200, it was restricted. So, and it said that, you know, and you shall marry only one. And then it goes on to say that, you know, you will not be able to deal justly with, uh, with uh, everyone. So therefore it is pointing out to a monogamous marriage. So if you have to understand everything that takes it goes yeah. step by step. Yes. And I think it's, a, it's very positive and I think we should go ahead with it. Yes, you know, and, and, and I know where you're coming from. And, and, and let me also, you know, uh, add to this from how I see. Uh, in a lot of the personal laws that exist today, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, discrimination against the women. 
or let's just yes. say they're not friendly at all for this one gender, uh, whether it's uh, marriage, divorce, inheritance, uh, in different, uh, you know, for, for different faiths and different sets of personal laws, there are huge amounts of problem. And one would hope that if we look at a system of a uniform civil code, uh, Sujata Paul, those problematic issues also go away. But for all of that to happen and for a conversation to happen, step one would be for everybody to come on the same platform without any political baggage about, oh, you're just trying to do it because you want to impose your agenda. You know, Sandeep, uh, as a student of law, I remember how excited I used to be when I used to, uh, you know, read all the case laws and think that, oh, you know, the Uniform Civil Code must be implemented. But, uh, you know, as I grew, I, I realized that things were not that simple. Our country has a very wide spectrum. The, you know, the conversation must begin, I agree. But uh, will this be used against people? That is a question. Right now, we've seen in the, in the present regime, we have seen how people have been treated, uh, you know, when you talk about their religion, how we are talking about interfaith religions. And that is why this problem is coming up. And that is why, uh, you know, the Honorable Allahabad High Court has uh, mentioned that Article 44 should be revisited. In fact, I remember in uh, July also, something similar came up in, at, uh, you know, in Delhi High Court. However, I remember uh, another particular matter of 1995 where big, uh, bigamy was a big issue. And uh, it was a mud, uh, some mudgal case. But the point Sala is, mudgal. are we going... Yes, sir. Sarla mudgal. So when we are talking about all these issues and when you look at all the cases, it's not as simple as it seems to be. Because every case, when you go into details of it, it is really, really concerning as to how they will be treated, how people will be treated. So I think this requires conversation, but first there should be uh, the rule of democracy established in this country. This division on the basis of religion that is happening in the country today should end before we think of implementing the Uniform Civil Code, which is necessary for the betterment of not just women. And increasingly so, says the Allahabad High Court, increasingly so. Um, now it is important uh, and, uh, uh, because of the interfaith marriages that are taking place and the various problems that are cropping up. And, and the fact that uh, state after state is coming up with its own set of laws to make it more complicated uh, and, and more problematic. In fact, the court was here in one of such cases, which is why the court specifically uh, made also observations on interfaith marriages and that, uh, uh, you know, that's why UCC is also needed. The court uh, and the same judge Justice Sunit, the same judge, ju uh, Justice Sunit Kumar, has also said that in Uttar Pradesh, you will not need a DM's certificate for registration of an interfaith couple's marriage. Because Prashant Umra, those are the kinds of new complicated laws that gov state governments are bringing out right now, uh, also adding to this problem. The need for a DM to verify you before you can actually get married, court says absolutely not. See, the new law in Uttar Pradesh mandates that DM has to verify whether there is forced marriage or not. There are many such type of marriages going on. And besides, uh, Allahabad High Court, even Delhi High Court also backed the implementation of uni uniform civil code in the country. And in uh, 2019 Supreme Court in Joe Paul versus Maria case said that UCC should be enacted as the state stage has reached the citizens of the country. And in, in, if you see uniform civil code involves having a common set of laws governing marriages, divorce and succession and adoption for all citizens instead of allowing dif different personal laws for people in different faiths. The aim of such uniform is meant to be ensuring equality and justice for women, particular who are often denied their rights in marriages, divorce, and inheritance under uh, patriarchal personal laws. So tell me something, Prashant Umra. If 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 we were to you know look at a uniform civil code for registering marriages, which would be the same for all, would you then say that everybody needs to get the DM's uh, certificate 
and validation before they get their marriage registered? See, even man, uh, many times court has said that uh, uh, all marriages should be, uh, should be registered. And no, all marriages have to be one, registered, but I don't need the DM's permission to register my marriage. This, uh, this case is uh, DM's permission is only for in case of interfaith marriages because there are many such uh, courtship measures are adopted in case of uh, interfaith marriages and many such cases are coming uh, every day. That's why uh, this law was brought in Uttar Pradesh. Mr. Deshratan Nigam, these are the kind of issues that will crop up. In fact, that's what's pushed the Allahabad High Court to say, uh, reminder, uniform civil court must be brought in. Mr. Nigam, I think you're on mute. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Tanvi, in fact, there are two issues out here. One is of uniform civil court and one is of the issue which arose in this particular case in UP. Now, the UP law has that before you perform a marriage, you the DM has to satisfy whether it has the consent has been obtained through fraud or otherwise. And the uh, Allahabad High Court has not struck down that law. It is in this particular case, in the facts and circumstances of this particular case, that they have made an observation. The law exists. The challenge probably is pending in court. It has not yet been set aside, nor the stay has been granted on that law. Suffice it to say to that extent on that particular aspect. Now, the second aspect of the Uniform Civil Court, uh, I am for it. And in fact, uh, we all should say that we need it. How to need it and what to, what is to be brought in is to be discussed. So the common minimum denominator is that we need Uniform Civil Court. And most of the opposition is coming from uh, Muslim Malvis, which is very surprising, and Muslim Personal Law Board, where they must understand that halala is not a today's practice and should not be a today's practice, or for that matter, polygamy or uh, other issues which are there. And there are certain issues in our society as well, by large, including Hindus as well. So those are the you know uniformity that we need, and it requires a lot of understanding of the diversity. There is no doubt about it. And every aspect has to be taken into consideration before you come to a particular law. Debates and discussions is a must, as we are doing it on television. It requires to be done even otherwise also. And therefore, it is a process of national integration. And today's youth know they don't want multiplicities of laws. And gender equality, unless and until you have equal, uh, you know, participation on an equal basis for the women, their participation in development will be an understatement and you will not be able to realize their potential. So therefore, in order to have the development of the country and to make this country a developed nation, mm -hmm. you require an equal participation of women that can only come through gender equality and uh, the non-exploitative policies or the complete lack of exploitation of our women folk. So various issues are there. I'm not saying the issues are not there. Right. But the fact remains, it is beyond politics. One should not bring politics as political parties generally tend to do. And these are personal laws and not religious laws. And let me tell you, these Malvis who are opposing, tell them we'll give you Sharia law under the criminal law also. They'll run away. Frankly, telling you, if, if a non-Muslim commits a theft, he should be jailed. And if a Muslim, the Malvis who are asking for, you know, Sharia law, tell them if you commit a theft, your hands would be cut. Believe me, they'll come on the same table immediately. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Just a cl clarification, uh, Mr. Nigam, because uh, from my understanding, and maybe, you know, you, you can um, you shed more light, because you said that... The Allahabad High Court's order about not needing a DM certificate is for that specific case. But the case the court was hearing was actually a bunch of 17 petitions uh, of interfaith couples. Would it still be only for those 17 petitioners? Yes, yes. Unless and until that law is specifically struck down, mm. that law holds. It will only for the, those people who are before the court. Okay. So, Zadabal, I see your hand, but allow me to just go across to Suhas Chakma to get his views in, and then I will come back to you. Mr. Chakma, I will come back to the same point that Sanjay Hegre began with. How do you define uniform civil court? What's the premise you start off with? Gender equality, for example, could be one of them. Well, I don't think there is any possibility of having uniformity with respect to civil court. Because when you talk about civil courts, it's not only about Hindus and Muslims. 
It's also about the tribal societies in the Northeast India. And each and every tribal community has enacted its own customary laws. And I am telling you, the moment you try to impose uniform civil code in the Northeast India, the country will disintegrate because the uniform civil code or customary laws are not about uh, only giving rights. It's about identity. It's about the politics. Now tell me, how are you going to bring a Kasi matrilineal society, which has a completely different set of laws, with respect to other societies, which are, you know, I mean, which follow patriarchy? So I think the, judge, the comments made by the what say the honourable judge of Allahabad, I could, it doesn't reflect the true situation or true diversity. I don't think this kind of a comment can be made by a judge in in Meghalaya. You would see there will be riots, you know. I mean, so I think if we want to, you know, promote national integration, that has to come through accepting diversities. And of course, you should never have a practice or policy uh, which, in a way, uh, you know, I mean, uh, promotes any kind of discrimination within my own society. There are the customary laws which I find it extremely difficult to agree with. But the moment you try to, you know, challenge that or say that we have to come with particular uh, uniform civil code. I don't think even the Chakmas only have an autonomous district council are going to accept it. So uniform civil code, when you discuss about it, please remember, there are so many customary laws, especially in the Northeast, it would be more dangerous than the Citizenship Amendment Act because it relates to land, it relates to ownership, it relates to you know, lineage and who will own the property and etc. So I think can, I can you think can you idea... just give, can you give Mr. Chakma one example where you can see I this becoming a big problem? One example amongst those customs uh, that you're talking that exists very, between in various tribes. See, can you just kind of repeat it again? Tani? Can you give one Sorry, example could... for for people to understand where example? it could become a big problem for tribals to give up on the traditions and customs that they've been following, whether it's in the case of marriage or even inheritance. So, with respect to inheritance, the Kasis have traditionally followed that the daughters will get the ownership of the property. Now, if you try to change that, it is not going to be accepted because that has been followed traditionally. And if you, uh, what you say, allow that change, I don't think they are going to accept it. So that's one particular incident where the ownership of land is completely different from the rest of the country. And why should Kasis accept it? You go and ask any Kasi, they won't like to change it. And they have rejected it. So one specific issue with respect to ownership. Only women and daughters can own the property. Okay. In fact, even the sun name has to be by the Okay. No, so this is can good. So we are looking at various examples that will crop up when this conversation actually happens can in I this way. In? Yes, Mr. Sanjay Hegre wants to make a point, and then Desh Ratan Nigam. Mr. Hegre has another no, example. Yeah, the example uh, is from um, my own community, which also is a matrilineal community. In a matrilineal community, uh, especially because of property and all that, uh, there are several instances of first cousin marriages which North India uh, uh, would look at uh, you know, in, in horror. By, uh, there is also a, a tradition in South India where a uh, maternal uncle can marry the niece. These are uh, marriages which happen within the family. So, but they don't. Uh, the, 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 a, would you say that when, when we start to codify yes. this, we would explore oh. and define the relations oh, which yes. are allowed and not allowed? Yes. Today you already have it. You have it that uh, the Hindu Marriage Act has what is called that the Sapenda relationship. They, those in a Sapenda relationship can, cannot marry, except where there is a, a custom to the contrary. So even the even the Hindu Marriage Act makes provisions for various customs across various communities. So there is no uniformity even even within Hindu matrimony. So who can you marry? How can you, you, you divorce? There is uh, and uh, whom who how much of your property can you leave by will? There is no current social uniformity. If you want to impose it by law, then. You, there is bound to be resistance. Mr. Chakma uh, highlighted the Northeast. I can see several other instances all over India, which will, which will all be impacted. I cannot speak for those communities and say that there will be resistance or there, there won't be a, a resistance. But everybody who 
who propagates uh, the uniform civil code as a kind of magical formula has not thought it through. And by one more uh, thought before I'm done, it is that the Allahabad High Court certainly had uh, no reason to simply comment on the uniform civil code. Mm. What was the, the question before it? The question before it was interfaith uh, uh, couples who had got married, who apprehended uh, problems at the hands of their parents or relatives, who did not uh, really want to get some pre-registered uh, permission of the DM, which would in turn leak out to society at large. The, that was the practical problem which was before the judge, and he could have very well solved it only within the ambit of the law. He's, he, he's made certain comments, which in my opinion are uncalled for. So a, at best today, a single judge of the Allahabad High Court has said that uniform civil code is a good idea without exactly defining what a uniform civil code is and in what context. Okay, uh, you know, to, to, to the point that you made and uh, about the, uh, where the judge was coming from and what the, essentially the case was, um, and, and there are several more rising number of instances of interfaith marriages that, uh, that have to be registered and couples really finding it difficult because it's so complicated under the Special Marriage Act, uh, which is another example of why maybe you need a simplified version. But does that simplified yeah, so, uh, version have to be for uh, the same for everybody? Or do you just look at a way of redoing the personal laws where you simplify it, make it gender equal, without actually overriding the existing customs and traditions? Can that be something, Sujata Paul, that we look at? You know, uh, not, you know I don't agree to uh, this particular point in such a simplified manner because the point is it's the BJP which really needs to be educated. Why am I saying that? Because, you know, this love jihad angle that they bring in, uh, they've also said that they will bring in a law for love jihad in uh, Madhya Pradesh. I'll give you an example of Uttarakhand from where I come. Uh, there is a certain amount of money which is given to people who, uh, you know, have interfaith marriages to encourage interfaith marriages. And when this happened recently, about a few months back in Uttarakhand, immediately uh, the government uh, issued, uh, you know, transfer orders of the officer who had granted that amount to this particular interfaith uh, uh, you know couples so what we need to do is we need to understand that we are a democracy and first we have to establish the rule of law because uh, you know one important thing we must not forget is when it is a muslim boy who marries a hindu girl it becomes a love jihad when it is a muslim uh, a girl who is marrying a hindu boy it is love so these are the things which uh, you know the bharti janta party always tries to turn into a political Okay, so yeah, so let's so let's honestly not go there. Uh, let's not let's not make it that yes. political fight. In fact, I, I I so far we've had an extremely you know uh, um, uh, interesting conversation where I am attempting to genuinely attempting to take it beyond oh um, Hindu Muslim love jihad or even to say that the Malvis have these problems because they're the ones who don't want to uh, and the BJP wants to impose their agenda on Muslims. That may very well be one aspect of the debate, but it's been done ad nauseum. There are several more aspects to the Uniform Civil Court conversation, which panelists here are bringing out. And I would like to continue on that because it, it really does help understand and highlight the nuances. It's not black and white, like you said, Sujata Paul. It's not so simple. So let's give some of more of those examples that will come through. Zira Chakat Ali, you wanted to make a point. Go ahead, please. No, all I was trying to say is that, you see, every every nation has evolved its laws. And as you grow, and despite all the complexities of, you know, of tribe, or, you know, of the cultures that we are dealing with, there has to be a bottom line that is going to give you justice, because law is supposed to be just. And law is supposed to give balance, and law is supposed to give justice. So that, I think, you know, is one of the primary, should be one of the primary premises of justice, of non-discrimination, of being able to, now, for instance, if you ask me about, you know, the, the love jihad, when there are two adults who are saying that, you know, uh, that, you know, we are in love and we wish to marry until and unless, you know, there is a fraudulent, you know, involvement which has to be uh, which has to be checked and which has to be which should be punishable you cannot you cannot 
marry somebody by fraud and that, that is out of the question. But what I'm talking about normally, you see, when people meet, we make such a hue and cry about it. All over the world, people are getting married to each other without all these uh, kind of impediments that you know one has to face. And once you're an adult, you're an 18 plus, how can a parent or any other relative interfere in your life constantly to tell you what you're supposed to do? I mean, that is, that is something that we have to debate and think about. Are we mature? We are maturing as a nation. We are growing up. But uh, are we really growing up when we bring about these, you know, these little, little, little bit laws in between so that, you know, you create a, you create a kind of a, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a, a flat platform, you know, that this is this is a straight line and that's the only way that you're going to live. So I think, uh, you know, the Uniform Civil Code's introduction is far beyond this. This is only a small part of it. First of all, you know, one nation, one law. And before that, you know, no discrimination. There has to be justice and especially gender justice. I think gender has suffered enough through all sorts of uh, you know, through all sorts of impediments that have been created in the path of women. I think it's right. time now for us to 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 take this uh, subject with more maturity and, of course, with much more discussion, with much more in-depth understanding and with much more to see that everyone is brought into this ambit, yeah. you know, with, with logic, with reason and with, uh, you know, with friendship because that is what the country is trying to do for you. The country doesn't want to inflict something on you that is going to make you suffer. It is doing something for you, for your betterment. Okay. And you have to think in those terms. I uh, think uh, that's yeah, I'll give you another example. Uh, you, you, for example, in Parsis, it's the same thing in this case is currently, um, there is a case in Supreme Court uh, where if a woman mar marries outside the religion, she loses her inheritance rights. Or if a non-Parsi woman... No, no. Uh, marries a Parsi, she doesn't get inheritance of her husband, uh, which could go to their children, but not to her. And this case is there in the courts right now. Mr. Suhas Chakma, the point that I'm trying to make is there may be certain um, regressive laws, personal laws and traditions that exist across faiths and, 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 and you know, uh, followers. Can we not look at at least fixing that part? No, as I said, you know, it is desirable. In fact, if one talks about human rights principles, equality, non-discrimination, that there should not be any kind of, you know, special reservation, etc. Because the moment you follow the principle of equality and non-discrimination, all these special privileges under the uh, customary laws will go away. I think what we are not trying to recognize the practicality and the reality of it. I am all for uniform civil laws. As I say, at the end of the day, all those who will be deciding, practically, they are also related to the, you know, community politics, identity politics, and it's not so much about, you know, only equality and non-discrimination or violation of gender rights. Uh, in fact, if you look at some of the communities in the Northeast, the, the mere recognition or the issuance of the gadget notification recognizing customary laws is a recognition of the community itself. So you see there are certain communities which customary laws have not been codified or has not been issued as, as you know, gadget notification. They are really fighting for it. And each time election comes up, prior to the elections, whether in Tripura, uh, you know, Meghalaya or elsewhere, you will see that the state governments, or the political parties, irrespective of the whole political parties, they are actually codifying and issuing gadget notifications. So this is not going to end in that sense because uh, however regressive it is, I mean, we have to realize that customary laws, I'm not talking about the Muslims and Hindus, in the Northeast India, customary law is part of the identity of the tribe or the community, and they shall not give it up, irrespective of whatever. They will bring in what you can make possibly that the customary laws have to comply with the principles of equality and non-discrimination. But there are certain principles where, you know, I mean, the, which go beyond equality and non-discrimination provision. So you have to have the customary laws comply with the fundamental rights chapters of the Constitution of India. That you can make it. I think that's the best way what is to go about it, rather than saying that, you know, we have, we need to have a, you know, uniform civil code. Uniform civil code is not the issue. 
the issue is whatever code you adopt uh, in your community, it has to comply with the basic principles of equality and non-discrimination. So I think that you know the communities can adjust themselves, you know, their uh, laws and etc. That's what is more important. That the any law enacted in this country has to comply with the basic features of the constitution. That's it. Okay, Prashant Umbra, would you want to respond to that? To say uh, it's not a very simple binary debate. It's not a uh, are you going to implement a Hindu code or a Muslim code? But it's also about several other faiths and several other tribes and their traditions and systems that they follow. See, there is uh, there are many discrepancies in personal law. The aim of uniform civil code is to provide protection to vulnerable sections like. Uh, women and religious minorities, as you mentioned in uh, Parsi Lodge. And while, uh, when we enact uh, the uh, uniform civil code, the purpose of is there to, uh, to simplify laws that are segregated at present on the basis of religious beliefs like Hindu court bill, Sariat law, Parsi line, and other laws. And the uniform civil code uh, will simplify the complex laws around marriages, ceremonies, inheritance, succession, and adoption, and making, uh, men, making them uh, one for all. The same code will uh, then be applicable to all citizens irrespective of all faiths in India. And we have even uh, uniform civil code in Goa also, and all citizens of Goa are living peacefully. There is uh, no complications. Okay, Mr. Deshwada Nigam, I want to uh, also approach it a little differently and get your view in on this. Why is it that if in our constitution, um, you know, it prescribes for a uniform civil code that we currently have all of these different sets of personal laws. And then why do you believe we should move from personal laws to one set of law? Uh, Tanvi, in fact, uh, the issue, in fact, I, I can take it very differently. This is, I look at it as from the point of um, gender equality and gender justice. Once you have, instead of calling out a uniform civil code, if we call something like gender equality or gender justice law, there will be more acceptance in the society because people, some people have that mental block against uniformity. So once you have this gender equality and gender justice law, that would be a beginning point and that could be a common denominator for all the societies. The tribal's way of life has been given protection under the constitution. So tribal's could be a different thing. But if there is a national law if there is a uniform national law for gender equality and gender justice to begin with, then uh, the state should be given power to have their own amendments looking into the regional uh, you know, requirements and aspirations of the people. That minor tweaking should be allowed by the, the law itself. Like in the Indian Penal Code itself, the state governments have their own amendments in the law. So that, if that is taken care of, so it could be a very, very good beginning to begin from this uh, for purposes of non-discrimination and equality of genders. And then you, you can move forward because then there will be a, a particular kind of a behavioral pattern all across the country. You require behavioral changes first, and then you know the laws must follow. But so far as gender equality and gender justice laws are concerned, I think there is already an environment in this country where you can move ahead irrespective of your religious belief, beliefs. So in my opinion, a beginning has to be made, maybe not as comprehensive as some people think, but to begin from this point of view, then there will be a general acceptance. Okay, Mr. Yegre, what's your view on that? Would that work? Well, anything would work provided the people who seek to implement it are seen as being honest brokers and not merely riding their power. That's one. And, and uh, in fact, uh, there are several aspects of um, all laws uh, we, which would be helpful. I don't see why uh, we cannot move as a society towards marriage as a contract rather than a marriage as a sacrament. Two people decide that they, that they will follow a contract and that they will marry and that uh, this, is, this is what will happen when the marriage gets dissolved. They, right now, uh, you... We, we see on um, a, a, among the majority community that um, uh, divorce becomes very hard. We, and uh, people spend uh, entire lifetimes in court, people uh, paying a lot of lawyers like uh, Mr. Deshrat Nigam and myself. Can, can we simplify a lot of laws? Yes, we can simplify a lot of laws. 
there can be certain things can be uh, which are not debated everybody can agree on to that extent yes but as i pointed out even within the hindu marriage act there is no uniformity to have one size fits all uh, is to my mind is not a possibility in a country of 1.3 billion people you know, mr deshratan nigam spoke about uh, gender justice there is also a concept called marriage equality where uh, that just as there are marriages between uh, men and women there can be marriages between two two partners of the same sex will the uniform civil code uh, uh, accept that where can you in incorporate that also into it our society is moving i think the conversation must start not with us old fogies it must start with the younger people somebody comes out with a draft and then um, it is honestly debated and the government says like if people come to a consensus we can pass it i see no problem on that note i'm going Tanvi, to thank all I, of the panelists can i come in uh, all right last word to mr nigam yes you know uh, the laws in fact hindu marriage is a sacrament no doubt about it but the laws have made it more like a contractual marriage and those changes have already come in like 125 crpc or or so many aspects have brought the, those changes so i think uh, the way the laws have made these changes and, and similar changes can be brought about although initially not as uniform as people are talking about but a beginning has to be made okay a beginning must be made i am going to say just this part uh, whether or not we are able to bring everybody on the same page and build a nationwide or a larger consensus on having a uniform civil code we have to wait and watch and really see how the government this government or in the future ever uh, really tackles the situation but one thing we must talk about one thing the government must look at one thing all stakeholders must look at and have a conversation about is to bring about some more equality when it comes to our personal laws gender equality when it comes to our personal laws and on that i am with zina shakat ali and deshratan nikam that that is much required whether you want to keep the essence of different personal laws as they exist today that's all right but they need to be gender neutral they need to do away with the laws which are, which are discriminatory and mostly discriminatory against one specific gender which is women that conversation needs to happen on a serious note now thank you so much for joining us tonight